Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Pauling. I, I can't get used to calling him Linus because he was my teacher and I had to say Dr. Pauling then. <laughs> um, I went to Caltech in physics and then I, I, I fell under Linus' spell when I uh, went to seminars and after the end of the first semester I came to him to switch to chemistry and he looked over my transcript and he says, what's that C in economics? I got an A in economics. <laughs> And I told him that's because I, I wasn't very interested and I never went to the class at all. Uh, but um, I went to my other classes. He let me in anyway. And uh, the war intervened and so I ended up uh, doing uh, research for part time and doing war research the other time. I'm not going to say very much about history except one or two things uh, that maybe fill in. I, uh, uh, I'm going to talk about protein crystallography today and uh, I remember my feeling when I read Byfoot's paper on double isomorphous replacement that this probably had solved the problem. I thought that ought to be mentioned as part of the history. Secondly, on the question of derivatives, which John Kendrew referred to, uh, we had a very difficult time getting started on this aspartate transcarbamylase molecule because of the high symmetry and the large molecular weight. And, uh, it wasn't until we got Cecil McMurray, who had the idea to make lots of modifications of the derivatives, organic modifications, for example, of phenyl mercuries, with the substituents in various places, and then to look at the kinetics, the kinetics of the binding. Simple kinetics means simple derivatives. And that's an idea which is not very widespread, but it worked extremely well. It's one of the more rational approaches to derivatives and it solved this problem. The particular problem was that there was a, a beautiful sulfhydryl group on the catalytic chain which was extremely unreactive. There were four sulfhydryls on the regulatory chain bound to a zinc, structural zinc, which uh, were extremely reactive and it wasn't until Cecil designed what was amounts to an affinity label for the active, the near the active site that um, it bound there preferentially and we were able to uh, get a simple derivative to get started on the phasing, uh, and, and I, I thought that was a, a fine approach. Um, now, let me have the first two slides. Uh, I have been I got showing my slides in pairs because I brought too many slides. <laughs> now, I'm going to talk a little bit about the reaction. The uh, chemistry is that the proton is lost here, leaving an NH2 group. But when you form what amounts to an amide bond here, you have to withdraw yet another proton. And uh, I'll talk about how that happens. Phosphate leaves. So when you, you make carbonyl phosphate react with aspartate, to make carbonyl aspartate, phosphate leaves. But phosphate is not bound to the enzyme. Uh, it's not a phosphoryl enzyme at all. So uh, the main reaction then is a proton abstraction. Uh, with a uh, nucleophilic attack of the nitrogen on this carbon. Later, these are cyclized to pyrimidines, and about six steps down the, the pathway is the allosteric inhibitor, which is uh, cytidine triphosphate. The enzyme shows sigmoidal character because of its multi subunit and cooperative behavior, and it's the homotropic character that I'm going to talk about today. That is, the <coughs> native enzyme in the absence of the inhibitor, cytidine triphosphate or the stimulator, adenosine triphosphate. I'll mention that at the end if I have time. Uh, the, this is a, one of the mechanisms by which you achieve a balance between py pyrimidines and purines and synthesis of nucleic acids. If you have too many pyrimidines like cytidine, then the enzyme slowed up. And if you have a lot of purines around like adenosine triphosphate, the enzyme is accelerated. ATP and CTP bind to the same site on a regulatory protein which is different from the catalytic protein. Well, that outlines it. First, the quaternary change. The uh, enzyme structure, it was thought to be a tetrabar when we started from the uh, kinetics work of uh, other people who had, done, who had done biochemistry. But we found it was a hexameric, that is six catalytic units and, uh, tr and six regulatory units. That's a dodecameric structure, hexameric in catalytic, hexameric in regulatory. And, uh, if, if you tip the threefold axis vertical, then you see a catalytic trimer up here, 
one down here, regulatory dimers here. And the CRRC interaction is going to be preserved in the transition. And here's Irving Geist's drawing of this, where this, uh, these uh, R1, R2, R3s are actually preserved in length, but reoriented as the allosteric transition occurs. Uh, this, the compressed being the T, or the less active form, the expanded being the R, the more active form of the enzyme. Uh, and the, the disc here represents a catalytic trimer and another one down here. So this is a simple schematic to get you oriented uh, on the, co the large conformational change. And the enzyme uh, before the conformational change looks like this uh, with the threefold axis vertical now, catalytic trimer in blue, another one down here, regulatory dimers here, here, and behind. The zinc atom, which is structural, is here. Uh, and the uh, regulatory site is going to be way out here where the catalytic sites are going to be inside the blue chain here. And that's about 60 angstroms for the propagation of those effects. The active form of the structure is very much more open with still some contact between the top catalytic trimer and the bottom catalytic trimer right in the region of this loop, which I'll call the 240s loop and which uh, uh, is uh, very critical in the allosteric transition. Uh, almost no change takes place in the R2, the, the two uh, chains of the dimer here. Uh, there's a 10-stranded pleated sheet, five in each uh, regulatory uh, chain here, and a few helices and so on. Uh, now that's uh, an idea of the quaternary change. And uh, now their um, a summary is that these catalytic trimers come apart about 12 angstroms in this transformation. And they rotate relative to each other five degrees. That is, five degrees one way for the top, five degrees the other way for the bottom. It's about 10 degrees total. And the R2s, the regulatory dimers, regulate about the twofold axis of the molecule by uh, uh, 15 degrees. Now, uh, here, I'm coming down to lower uh, resolution, is the domain structure. A catalytic uh, chain has a, a domain that binds aspartate which is called the equatorial domain here, and a polar domain that binds phosphate. And these come together in the uh, binding of substrates, uh, of these uh, two. Uh, the zinc site uh, is uh, on the regulatory chain. The allosteric site is out here uh, on that side. So the, the regulatory chain also has um, two domains, and we'll see a little bit more of that. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to do that. And so I've messed it up. I punched the wrong one. Can you put it right? Put this one back, too. Maybe I can do it. Yeah, uh, 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 yeah, that's right. Right, next one. Oh, uh, that's fine. And the next one here. Next one here. OK, put this back. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> OK, sorry. I pushed the wrong button. It's all my fault. The, the projection is fine. Uh, here are the domains in the catalytic chain, the active sites shared between uh, these domains. It is also shared between adjacent chains of, um, uh, of the catalytic trimer. Now, this is one catalytic unit and one regulatory unit with the zinc domain here and the uh, allosteric effector domain, the cytidine triphosphate, venison triphosphate binding site here. That's where the R is, pleated sheet, uh, zinc atom. And the phosphate crevice, which goes in here, represents the binding between uh, these domains. And as I said, the active sites uh, uh, on another catalytic chain share here. And we'll see a little bit more of that now. Maybe I'll do it right. Uh, there, now, to go to one more level, there are tertiary changes in structure, uh, which involve the um, movement, the, the, the movement together of the two domains of one catalytic chain. And that movement goes from the red, the T form, the less active form, to the blue, the R form, the more active form, when a substrate or a substrate analog binds. In this case, I'll show you what that is in just a second, but that's the movement. And that involves this 240s loop uh, that is here in yellow. And that in the T, less active form of the enzyme, has a very extensive interface uh, with uh, uh, adjacent chains uh, uh, above and below. And here, uh, not very much of a change. But this transformation, 
is not possible unless this tertiary change is made. And that is triggered by the binding of phosphate to a number of groups, including five positive charges, four arginines and one lysine in the active site. So that triggers the tertiary change, which triggers a quaternary change. And that's uh, how the uh, Rube Goldberg machine works. Uh, now, here is the substrate analog that was bound. It's N-phosphoinacetyl L-aspartate. So this is, looks like aspartate. But the, uh, the oxygen has been replaced by CH2. So of course, this cannot leave as phosphate. Whereas in the substrate, it, the, the phosphate can leave after the attack of this uh, nitrogen lone pair on the carbonyl carbon of carbonyl phosphate. So this then shows you the resemblance between that molecule and this. These are the contours of the uh, PALA, I'll just call it PALA molecule uh, here. The uh, particular around the active site, the, the uh, density is really very good. These structures are highly refined. They're about 0.16 in the conventional R value uh, uh, that protein crystallographers use. Uh, I hadn't realized uh, we'd been working on this problem about 20 years. Uh, uh, well, I'll comment on that at the acknowledgment level when I finish. Now, in the active site, the uh, PALA molecule is bound to a great many residues, side chains. And uh, they involve serine, serinines, and so on. But more, more interesting, arginine 105 binds both to the alpha carboxylate group on this side and to the phosphate. And lysine 84, serine 80, which come in from an adjacent chain, adjacent catalytic chain in a catalytic trimer, bind, lysine 84 binds both to an oxygen of phosphate and a beta carboxylate group of the aspartate. So this looks as if uh, the enzyme's designed to pull things together. If you substitute just a sulfur atom for that carbon in aspartate, in, in a real reaction with carbonyl phosphate, the uh, enzyme uh, has its activity reduced by a factor of about 1,000. And, and moreover, it doesn't select for any other amino acid except aspartate for practical purposes. So the, the number of binding sites is totally consistent with that. For proton transfer groups, I'll point out there's a histidine here, which is bound to this oxygen and which could have received a proton if this had been the donating nitrogen, or uh, an oxygen, a phosphate, could have received a proton. Now, uh, if you, I'm going to talk about mutants. In fact, the story today really is on the mutants. Uh, about 20 or 30 such mutants have been made. We've done the structure of very few of them, but I'll comment on some of the chemistry because in the first place, the, the, the question is, do we have the right active site? When you have a strong binding inhibitor, you may have anomalous binding. This is not uncommon. And so we have to uh, check with the mutants to see whether uh, you, if you replace some of these amino acids, uh, you actually affect the activity. And uh, everything is OK. Lysine 83 is not bound to the substrate. And it doesn't affect. It's not affected when you replace it by glutamine. On the other hand, lysine 84 is bound. And if you replace it by glutamine, then uh, it, uh, the enzyme is less active, considerably less active. Arginine 105 to histidine leaves the enzyme active, but we're at low pH in this, these crystals, around 6 or 7, depending on which crystals we're looking at. Then uh, the histidine could acquire a positive charge. And it turns out when you make arginine 105 into alanine, the activity drops very considerably. So this was the only surprise out of the whole lot. And we didn't do a structure yet on it, but it looks like that's a, a, a reasonable story that the histidine has acquired a positive charge and is behaving more or less like arginine. Uh, again, glutamine to zero. Well, I don't have Schachmann's work on the, um, uh, on the histidine to alanine, but that activity is down to 5% of its normal activity, which means that the histidine uh, could account for a large measure of the activity, but the enzyme still proceeds uh, with 5% of its activity if you have an alanine there. And perhaps that part of it goes through uh, 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 transfer of the proton to the phosphate. 
So we're a little ambiguous on the mechanism of proton transfer, but it's well set up for isotope tracer work. So, uh, and uh, the replacement of the large number of positive charges, arginine 105, 167, 229, uh, uh, around the active site, uh, again, is consistent with the story. So we feel that the chemistry that correlates with these amino acid replacements checks the structure in a real sense, saying, yes, we are at the active site, and this is bound as substrates should be bound. Now, I'll talk about these other mutants later, when I, and I'll, you'll see this slide again, so don't pay any attention to that yet. Uh, now, uh, if, you, if you ask, the PALA molecule is now all spread out here with the phosphonate group CH2 here. If you, if you ask how does the reaction occur, you have to get perpendicular attack of the aspartate uh, nitrogen here on the carbamyl group uh, of uh, aspartate. This means that this group has to be reoriented. And if you do that in a model, you reorient it perpendicular, then uh, you have an arginine and a new side chain, glutamine 137, which is essential for activity. When that's mutated, then the activity drops to zero, essentially. And uh, so this was discovered first by model building, uh, making this plane perpendicular so the NH2 of aspartate could attack. Well, this is purely model building. In the next slide, it has now been possible to bind carbamyl phosphate, which is one of the real substrates, with other things, such as succinate. Now, succinate differs from aspartate in that it doesn't have the NH2 group. And, uh, and now we find that the, the phosphate of carbamyl phosphate is bound exactly as the phosphonate group in PALA is bound, and the aspartate carboxylate groups are bound as, uh, in PALA as the same as the succinate carboxylate groups. But in between, we have exactly that perpendicular direction of attack with the hydrogen bonds to just the residues that were discovered by model building. And this is real experimental data. And here are the contours. It's about 2.8 angstrom resolution. You don't see all of the atoms, as Dorothy sees in insulin. But uh, uh, it, uh, it's the best we can do with the resolutions that we have. Uh, so this is carbamyl aspartate, uh, carbamyl phosphate up here, and this is succinate. We have a number of others uh, in the active site, and I'll just show you uh, a comparison. This is carbamyl phosphate, as found experimentally, a tetrahedral intermediate model built from the PALA structure in this purple color, and then uh, uh, succinate, which is here. And that's a uh, pretty, uh, pretty good superposition. Uh, this is another set of superpositions. This is, one is the PALA molecule, the blue one. Again, carbamyl phosphate is here. And uh, uh, that's an experimental uh, result. So is the PALA. This is aspartate. That's a model-built PALA showing that it sticks up in this direction and could very well attack this carbon carbonyl group. Now. Uh, um, one more uh, part of the reaction is, can we go to products? Well, a product would be carbamyl aspartate plus phosphate. That's the product. And we've modeled that with citrate, which is more like a tetrahedral intermediate at this point uh, uh, because of this hydroxyl group. And uh, in the same kind of map, the phosphate is bound exactly as it's found in both the previous studies. and the uh, uh, the, the citrate is bound uh, just with the two of the three carboxylate groups bound exactly where the two are bound for, um, uh, for pala or for melanate. So again, we have checked experimentally that this is the active site. And this oxygen is 2.6 angstroms, plus or minus 2 tenths, from the carbonyl, uh, the carbon atom of this carboxylate group as a model. And so that looks like it ought to uh, make a reaction if you were able to make that phosphate attack the carbonyl, uh, the uh, carbon of the carboxyl group. So this is a product, and it shows very clearly that we have the right active site, and uh, and our models are going. We have yet to uh, 
uh, we have some other studies going that uh, I'll tell you about some future year. Well, that's the, the active site story. And uh, now I want to talk about the homotropic cooperativity. And I'll concentrate on only a few of the distinct salt bridges that are changed when the enzyme um, uh, undergoes this large conformational change. The most amusing, glutamic 239 is bound both to tyrosine 165 and lysine 164, as you will see, in the other uh, uh, and opposite catalytic chain. And over here, glutamine 239 is also bound to 164 and 165, not in an opposite chain, but in the same chain. So it switches its binding completely and binds to the same two residues, but in the same chain instead of an opposite chain. That's curious. That really is curious. Uh, here is uh, tyrosine 240 and aspartic 271, and I'll point that out. Um, now, I think perhaps um, this is the, these hydrogen bond salt links are important for the stability of the more active form, and I'll comment on them. So that's a little summary of the ones that I'll just single out. Uh, here is um, what I mean by the two chains. Here's the catalytic trimer up here. Three-fold axis is vertical. The catalytic trimer down here. I'm talking about what we call the C1, C4 interaction. That's between the, carb the, 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 the two catalytic trimers. Interaction of catalytic chain between two catalytic trimers. Remember the 240s loop is here. And then in the more active form, the 240s loop is here. So it's this interaction I'm talking about. And this is one of Irving Geis's beautiful drawings of just that interaction, the glutamic 239 with uh, tyrosine 165 and, and lysine uh, 164 here, a cross between this catalytic unit and this one, and of course mirrored by the twofold axis. And then, uh, that's the wrong expression, isn't it? Mirrored by a twofold axis. I'm sorry, I apologize to crystallographers for saying that. <laughs> Related by a two-fold axis. <laughs> uh, and here is that same interaction with uh, uh, this uh, side chain, but uh, it's, it's bound back into the enzyme uh, in the R form uh, to the same two residues, but within, uh, within the two domains of uh, one catalytic unit. This is a catalytic chain, another catalytic chain here. And uh, uh, this is aspartate, and this is carbonyl phosphate in our models. And, uh, of course, it's malinate and so on. And here's Geis' signature right here. <laughs> so this uh, illustrates how the breaking of the salt link will, uh, will disturb the T form and, uh, and uh, the R form, too. But, uh, but we'll see the effect of the mutations in a minute on that. Uh, this is a diagram which, again, shows glutamic 239 and lysine 164, tyrosine 165, cross subunits, C chain here, C chain here. And the same over here, but, but the glutamic 239 is now bound back to the lysine 164 and tyrosine 165 within the same chain. Now again, uh, uh, the other one that I'm going to comment on is tyrosine 240, which is bound here to aspartic 271 and not bound to anything in the protein in the R form. So modification of either tyrosine 240 or aspartic 271 should destabilize the T state and favor the R state. And that is indeed true. Now those modifications have been done. We've actually done the structure on that one too. Well here then is a quick summary. For the stability of the R form, the other salt links that I didn't point out on the slide uh, are these, 50, 167, 234. When each of the, that, that set of salt links is not present in the T form, and when, when each of these is modified, the activity, go, the, uh, activity goes way down. Those are the, the genetic modifications. These all have been done in the laboratory of one of my former students, uh, Evan Kentrowitz at Boston University, uh, sorry, Boston College, and we are uh, doing the structure work, and uh, um, ha that's been a cooperative effort for some time now. Now the stability of the T form, tyrosine 240 modified to phenylalanine disturbs that salt link and, uh, 
uh, the one, the bridge to uh, our Spartake 271. And when that's modified to a asparagine, you also get a destabilization of the T form. Uh, and finally, the one that I just pointed out, glutamic 239 to glutamine disturbs the T form uh, because you don't have the inter subunit bridging anymore. And the same for tyrosine to serine, uh, lysine 164 has not yet been modified. That's one of the ones that hasn't been done. So all of these modifications support the picture that the, the salt links across that C1, C4 interface are very important for the stability of the R and T forms. There are many amino acids which have not been modified, but these really work, and you can understand them in terms of the structure. So the 240s loop interaction between tyrosine 241 and 271 actually stabilizes the T form, and uh, that prevents the uh, catalysis by maintaining the T form. But if you modify that, uh, you stabilize the R form, and uh, it's stabilized by these salt links, 164, 165, 239, uh, which again can be stabilized by those chemical modifications. So it's a consistent story on the homotropic effect. And the 240s loop, again, I'll remind you, is uh, here uh, with a ex rather extensive interaction, and over here with not much of an interaction, tyrosine 240 not binding uh, to uh, aspartate 271. Uh, here is the hydrogen bond to 271, uh, tyrosine 240, the one that's broken up when you make phenylalanine there. And this is the, that's the T form, and this is the R form locally. The uh, 240s loop is here and here. Well, in terms of the activity, the normal enzyme has a nice sigmoidal curve that I showed you at the very beginning. This one, it's still the T form when you don't have aspartate, but it changes to the R form at a much lower concentration of aspartate than the uh, native enzyme does. So that uh, you see it's much more susceptible to the transformation from the T to the R form. As a control, if you take the catalytic trimer, you see no effect whatsoever. So that uh, this means that, uh, uh, that it's, this effect is definitely related to the quaternary structure and, inde and independent of just the catalytic trimer alone. That the tri catalytic trimers can be isolated and they're active as well. And this is a test on, on that. That's just a control. Well, uh, this then comes to the question of the regulation. Uh, Irving Geis didn't sign this one. I just, at least I don't see the signature. Uh, but uh, this shows, again, the C1-C4 interaction, catalytic trimer up here, catalytic trimer here, with the regulatory dimers here, and the, here is cytidine triphosphate attempting to come in here, and uh, here is adenosine triphosphate coming into the more active expanded form uh, where the uh, stretching has been 12 angstroms along this direction. Uh, and the rotations about uh, 15 degrees about the uh, two-fold axes of the molecule are indicated here. Very nice drawing. I think these should have been in your art ex exhibition. Maybe they weren't. Maybe they are. Oh, you just finished them. Yesterday. <laughs> yes, I should have said something about that, uh, that uh, citrate phosphate experiment. That was just finished yesterday, too. The slides were made last night. <laughs> <laughs> now, we then have the following comments to make about the concerted allosteric transition. Carbonyl phosphate binds first, before aspartate. That agrees with the kinetics, it agrees with the structure. A conformational change takes place, a local one, not very much, two angstroms uh, in the backbone. The link between glutamic 50 and arginine 105 is broken because 105 binds to the substrate. And, uh, this conformational change allows aspartate to bind. As aspartate binds, the 240s loop reorients because you, you then close the, begin to close the active site, and that closure moves the 240s loop. A reorientation of the 240s loop is sterically hindered by the other 240s loop. So you, the expansion along the threefold axis um, allows the reorientation of all the 240s loops and you can't just orient one without or reorienting all of them. And so the transition, at least the homotropic transition, is cooperative. Uh, the 240s loop is stabilized in the new position. 
C1, C4 elongates, C2, C5, and C3, C... That's all one catalytic trimer, C1, C2, C3, the other C4, 5, 6. And so all 240s loop reorient, all the domains close, and the high affinity, high activity rate is created in a concerted function. Schachmann and Foote have shown that one pallet molecule bound to a, the enzyme with six active sites will make the conformational change. So that's, uh, that's the end of the homotropic effect. And if I have a few minutes left, how many minutes do I have left? Five minutes. Oh, good. Uh, five minutes before my five minutes of discussion? Okay. <laughs> uh, so I'll say just a few words about uh, the, uh, the allosteric site. I must warn you, we have not done all the mutations that are required in order to trace the pathways, only some of the allosteric transformation and the all allosteric effector, uh, the transmission of the information over 60 angstroms. But that's in progress, and a little bit has been done. Lysine 94 and tyrosine 189 bind near the triphosphates in the regulatory site. The R means regulatory chain. And uh, lysine 94 is definitely involved in binding the triphosphate, and tyrosine 89 is only a little bit involved in the CTP inhibition. But if you put the ATP in place of CTP, then tyrosine 89 is pushed around quite a bit by the larger ring of ATP and CTP. And this is uh, uh, also supported by the mutations. Uh, mutations have been made at both of these side chains now. Uh, here is the binding site uh, shown rather schematically here, the tyrosine there, and uh, uh, tyrosine 89, and here is lysine uh, 94. This binds a phosphate. Uh, this is near, binds the carbonyl of 89 binds the uh, uh, NH2 of uh, cytidine triphosphate. Uh, this is in the regulatory site. Uh, but uh, if, if you have the uh, other ring here, why that group is moved much more. And that uh, uh, means ATP uh, greatly stimulates a mutant that's been made here uh, because the tyrosine is much smaller in the mutation. Okay, now this is a superposition of uh, ATP and CTP, you can see the double ring of adenosine, the, the single ring of CTP, with the phosphates down here, slightly displaced, but this is superimposed in three dimensions, more or less, uh, on a two-dimensional projection uh, to indicate that we have established that uh, CTP and ATP bind almost in the same uh, positions, certainly in the same region, which is here. That's the binding region outside the pleated sheet of the regulatory dimer. The zinc domain is here. The critical parts are the movement of the two domains of the regulatory chain. This domain has water molecules in it. In the T form, it closes and, ex 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 and extrudes the water molecules in the R form of the enzyme. So you get a little bending about this hinge. And, uh, uh, and here is a salt link that I have not discussed, but it's between an arginine and a glutamic. 130 in the regulatory chain, 204 in the catalytic chain. This salt link change, makes a switch in the T to R transition. And this might be one of the pathways of communication. Unfortunately, it isn't, because mutations have been made of both of these side chains, and no effect occurs in the regulation. I thought for a while this was a nice pathway alternative to this. Why two pathways? Well, because the glutamic 239 mutant separates the ATP effect from the CTP effect. That mutant is susceptible to ATP stimulation, but not to CTP inhibition. A mutant which uh, Guy Hervé is working on in Paris, uh, in which uh, a number of half, uh, eight side chains of uh, the regulatory unit at the end terminus are substituted by six side chains of lambda phage in an experiment that was more or less an accident, also disconnects ATP and CTP effects. So I was looking for two pathways, and it looks like both of them are going to be through here, this, uh, this bridge between these two. Here's the active site, and the mutants in that region will be of very great interest. Uh, there are some mutants already done in that region right here. And uh, uh, I think that... Uh, I guess I'm being 
uh, told that I have five minutes for discussion. <laughs> and just in time, because, as you see, I have come to the acknowledgement slide. Now, um, first let me say that uh, we have just, Eric Guo, who is not listed because the slide is a little old, Kurt Krauss and David Evans, these are the three people that are missing from the list. Uh, Eric Guo is the only person in my group who is working on this enzyme. I do not want to give you the impression that my group is this size. This has been going on for 20 years. And uh, you may recognize some people like Don Wiley and others around here. Uh, but it, here is a, a crystal experiment that is very interesting to crystallographers because with this very large conformational change, we have succeeded in producing that single crystal of the T state going to a single crystal in the R state with that kind of a conformational change. How do we do it? Carefully. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Bill. <laughs>